This content may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion advised. With nothing but the faint noises of crackling and scattering of animals in the woods, we are starting to panic at this point. I couldn't understand why my dad didn't want me talking to the nice man who only gave me tractor rides, gave me lollies and hugs and sometimes the occasional sandwich. This was an ungodly sound that I've never heard in my life. From Disturbed Media, join your host, Chad, for true tales of horror, bizarre happenings, and unexplainable events. This is Disturbed. Welcome back in, everyone, and thanks for joining me. This week, I'm bringing you four true horrifying tales that will frighten and disturb. So sit back and listen close as we dive into the horror. We open the show hearing from Reddit user Fourth Degree Knight, featuring voice work by Tom Aglio, and we clean up the scene. Some of my previous posts regarding my experience doing crime scene cleanup work, or trauma scene work as we called it, generated a lot of people messaging me asking me to write up more stories from my past. I used to do this work in the early 1990s and ran into all kinds of situations such as accidental deaths, suicides, fire deaths, explosions, homicides, unattended deaths, and pretty much any messed up situation that could happen inside of a home or structure. One of my first calls when I started doing this work, it was probably around like 1993 to 1994, was to a really, really rich, fancy home. The home was located in a very wealthy area of Los Angeles up in the Hills area, and it was a huge home with a lot of land surrounding the home. This was the first time I ever saw an elevator in a home. I never met the homeowner or actually any representative from the person who owned the home, as all the paperwork was done via fax. I think it was owned by an Asian family, but couldn't be 100% sure. I only thought this at the time due to the furnishings and stuff inside the home. The home was pretty much emptied out of most of the personal contents prior to our arrival, so I didn't see any family photos on the walls. The home was so huge that you could get lost inside. Up to this point, I had never been inside a multi-level home, much less one with so many bedrooms, game room, indoor pool, bar, dens, family rooms, basements, and I think a six-car garage, if I remember correctly. Anyway, we started work on this one really late in the evening. It was once a crime scene, but by the time it was released to us, there was other damages that I couldn't explain. I assumed that the person was killed in the master bathroom as there were signs of trauma and some bullet holes in the bathroom shower and surrounding walls. Not much blood and that kind of stuff to clean up as I think the person must have died in the huge walk-in shower. What was odd was that I don't know if the shooter turned on all the water faucets in the house because there was water damage all throughout the house, kind of like Home Alone wet bandit stuff. There were areas where we had to remove wet drywall, wet carpet, baseboards, wood flooring, wet ceilings, and cabinets. Since this was all over this huge house and my crew at the time were just about like five of us, we split up doing different areas. This house was so big that you couldn't hear each other from different areas even if you were screaming. But we all carried these old Motorola walkie-talkies that we could call and communicate with each other for miles. One of the issues we were dealing with was that in certain areas of the house, the lights were off. I think prior to us coming out, an electrician shut off power in different areas because electrical components got wet. We all decided that using the elevator wasn't a good idea, and we just used stairs and walking through the different areas of the home was completely dark. We thought about using our generator, but the house was too big and there were so many rooms, so we just ran extension cords with light to areas we needed, but this still didn't light up enough of the house. I remember two of our guys were working on the upstairs, I think you would call it third or fourth floor the area where the murder took place. Another guy was working by himself in what looked like a bar, indoor nightclub area, removing wet cabinets and flooring. Another guy was working on this huge walk-in closet, tearing out wet carpet and drywall from floor to ceiling. I started working in a basement area. There was some ceiling and walls that needed to be removed. This job was going to be an all-nighter because of the vast areas and multiple areas that all the damage was, and we kept finding more and more. 
Also, everything that we removed that was damaged was a long trek to take it out of the house and down the drive to our trucks, adding to the time it took. So why is this a scary or creepy story? Well, imagine being in this huge home where a murder took place for one, but as we go on through the night working, we started hearing and experiencing things. Our old radios would do a beep beep chime when someone was about to say something over the air since it was only our company that had these radios, it wasn't random interference from outside sources, and we hadn't experienced such things before, but as the night went on and we were working, we kept getting alerts that someone was about to talk, so I and others would drop what we were doing and listen for after the beep beep, like for someone to say something, but no one spoke. Okay, so maybe the guys were fooling around with the radios. I was making my way with a trash can of debris out of the basement as I didn't want to make my trash too heavy to carry out. I made several loads, and it was a summer night, so getting out in the cool summer air was also a benefit. One of these trips, I had to go up the stairs from the basement and down a long hallway. I believe to my right was an opening to a larger living room type room, and to my left were some windows to the outside, but further down was the door that I needed to take to exit and take my debris out. One of these trips, the lights all went out. I got some light from the moon outside, but to my right, the rest of the house seemed unnaturally dark. As I make my way back to the truck, I grab the small flashlight in case this happened again. After a while of working the basement area, one of my guys comes up to me and starts chatting. I could tell he's nervous, and he starts on me saying, wouldn't it be better if we work together, that way we can finish up areas quicker? I could tell he didn't want to be by himself, so I agreed, and honestly, I knew how he felt. At about 1 a.m., we all decided to take a break and meet in the pool table room and eat and, you know, relax. We started exchanging stories about the place, mostly on how cool it was, but also on how creepy it was. We all experienced random whole sections of the house losing power, only for it to come back on again then at a different section. The guys that were on the upstairs part talked about hearing music but couldn't find the source. I brought up who's the dumbass who keeps hitting the talk button. No one did. We started coming to the realization that this job wasn't going to be completed tonight and it would be a two or three day job. We talked about our options and one of them was, since it was nearly two at that point, we should work a few more hours and sleep there and get up and go shower and go back to our office. I, for one, wasn't into the idea of sleeping in that house and overruled and said, we'll work a couple more hours than call it a day. The following day, we already had another job on the books, so we got home and rested a little, then back at it. We got back to the big fantasy house around 3 p.m. and decided to work as long as we could, then finish it up the following day. That evening, we sent one of the guys for pizza, and we kept working, so there was two of us paired up, and when the pizza came, we would break, eat, and rest up a bit, then back to it. I know this is drawn out, but for the things that happened the next day, I'm not sure if it was us being super tired and sleep deprived or if something else was going on in the house. After we ate our dinner and once again back in the pool table room, we're just relaxing as the work and distances in this house takes a toll on us. We decide the best case so no one of us gets too tired lugging the trash is we'd split that duty. One guy will go, then come back, and another guy would go and come back and so on. Almost everyone hears music playing at some point in the house. I heard it walking down from the kitchen area to that long hallway, but it sounded like it was coming from another location in the house. Another guy heard it coming from upstairs in the master bedroom area, but when you got up there, it sounded like it was somewhere else. Okay, just music, no big deal. One of our guys called this over the radio as he was making his way back from taking debris to our trucks and said, hey, was someone over in the kitchen pantry room? We were all saying no, and why? He said the doors open and it wasn't before. We joked with him that he was probably hungry. It was about midnight at this point, and I was working in one of the extra bedrooms that had its own private bathroom. This area was down a long hallway that had a few other rooms and ended in a den-type area. I was with one of my guys and we both jumped as we heard a loud bang. It sounded like something big and flat hit the ground. Kind of like if you knocked over a large piece of furniture and I got on the radio and checked on my guys thinking they broke something and everyone said no, that they hadn't broke anything and no one else heard it. My coworker and I sure did, so we go down the hallway and look around, maybe a picture fell from the wall or something, you know, fell over, but there was nothing. One of the last trips from that area, my coworker took the debris to the truck and I was left alone in the room waiting for him to return and the lights go out. I'm sitting here in this room in the dark. All down the hallway is pitch dark for some reason, not even enough light from the moon. He took our flashlight with him. I start to make my way out of the room going down to the den area that led to a larger open room then from there to a living room and dining room then onto the kitchen and I start to see the light from the pool table room. So I start to make my way over there then those lights go out. I get on my radio and call out that all the lights on the second floor were out. I start to hear someone walking towards me coming from the living room area and thinking he was my coworker, I call out to him and didn't get a response. I stood there in silence. Then I start to see a flashlight moving around and it's another coworker. He said that in his area the lights were on and heard me yelling for him. I didn't yell, I only had called on the radio. Just as we are talking, the lights come back on. My coworker with the trash can and the flashlight comes back in. 
The last and final day we go out to finish, I canceled our schedule so that we could finish the job in the light of day, no more evenings or middles of the night working or being in that house. After we were all done, we started exchanging stories about it, and one guy said that he swears he heard me yell for him. I promise I didn't, probably because I was frozen. The lights turning off and on was everywhere. It wasn't like an electrical issue, but someone messing with us. One guy said he went to use one of the only functioning restrooms and had saw someone walk by when he opened the door, and it wasn't one of us. One of our guys claimed he heard footsteps in another room. We all heard the music, and one thing about the music is we all heard a different type. I hear what sounded like classical music like Chopin or Mozart. Another one said it sounded like country music, but he couldn't make out the lyrics. We were all like, what the was that about? Get your voice on Disturbed with our hotline, available 24-7 completely free. Tell us your experience or just leave your comments on the show. Visit hotline.disturbedpodcast.com on your mobile device or computer. Up next, we have an email submission from Amy, featuring voice work by Sarah Thomas. And we see the lights. I'm from Australia, the western suburbs of Sydney, specifically. I live roughly a two-hour drive from Belonglo State Forest. This is the forest where notorious serial killer Ivan Malat hid up to seven or more young backpackers' bodies between the years of 1989 to 1993. Police believe there could have been many more, as this forest is quite large. We like to call it the murder forest. The forest is still open to the public for camping and recreational activities. It is actively one of my partners and my favorite camping locations. As we are from Western Sydney, four-wheel driving is an avid hobby in our area. We packed our camp gear, got the car ready, and headed to the forest. We set up camp in one of our favorite, very secluded spots. Picture a large circular opening surrounded by forest and trees. We decided to kick back and relax for a few hours and have a few drinks by the fire. The sun slowly set and night was upon us. Being young and in a then newish relationship, we decided to go for a nighttime drive and try to do some of the four-wheel drive tracks in the forest. Everything was going smoothly for a while. We drove through the tracks with ease until we reached a long, deep track where multiple vehicles had previously attempted to drive through creating long, deep tire marks filled with water and mud. We said, fuck it, let's give it a go. We drove through the first section with a bit of traction, and all of a sudden the back end of the car just sinks into the mud. My partner is pumping the accelerator. The tires just keep spinning, and we are officially stuck. We hop out of the car to see the damage, and you best believe we were very stuck. The whole back end of the flatbed truck is inches away from being underwater. We start digging by hand to get the mud from under the tires. We even put the rubber floor mats under the tires to try and get some traction, with no luck. Keep in mind, it is pitch black by now in the middle of the murder forest, miles from camp and miles from another human being to come help pull us out. We keep digging for what seems like hours and taking turns to drive out while the other stands at the back. We eventually gave up. We grabbed whatever dry clothes we had in the car and realized we left our phones at camp. So not only are we stuck miles from camp in the murder forest, we also have no form of light or phone service. At this point, it's around midnight, according to the time on the car radio. We set off into the forest to try and find our way back to camp. We took multiple turns down very long stretches of dirt roads whilst driving, so navigating back in the pitch black of night was nearly impossible. We walk, and walk, for roughly two hours, cold, wet, and covered in mud on pitch black dirt roads, with nothing but the faint noises of crackling and scattering of animals in the woods. We are starting to panic at this point, as it is at least 2 a.m. and we are completely lost. We started screaming out for help in the hopes that there are some other campers nearby. No one answers. The forest goes silent at this point. Not even the birds or animals are making any form of noise. Both terrified, 
we decide to turn back and try to at least get back to the car for safety and shelter for the night. As soon as we turned around, I spotted what seemed to be a trail of small dim lights on the right side of the dirt road we were walking on. I turned to my partner and asked if he was seeing them also. He hesitantly says, yes. Keep in mind, my partner in no way believes in the supernatural of any kind and is genuinely afraid of any witchy voodoo shit as he calls it. I, on the other hand, was raised to believe and have taken part in many supernatural activities. Obviously curious, we start walking in the direction of the lights and for whatever reason, I'm feeling a sense of calm following them, as if someone or something is trying to guide us home. As we get closer to each small dim light, they disappear, as if it was never there in the first place. But as each light disappears, another shows up in its place a few hundred meters ahead from the last. This continues all the way until we come to a right-hand turn that we recognize as the turn back to our campsite. We recognize it as it has a large wooden fencing around the corner of the turn. We take the right turn and the lights fade as if they were never there. We walk maybe 500 meters up this road and see our campfire in the distance. My partner and I looked at each other in almost disbelief at what had just happened, but ignored it and both started running to the entry of our secluded camping area. We both get changed out of our wet, muddy clothes and sit under the camp awning we built where all our kitchen equipment is. We sit down and start talking about the lights and the experience we both just encountered with disbelief and gratitude to whatever had just occurred. Remember earlier when I stated my partner has no belief or interest in the paranormal or spirits? Well, if what had just happened to us didn't change his mind, this next part of our evening definitely put some doubts in his heart. As we were sitting and chatting in our kitchen area, a few white moths started to appear under the small light we had going to illuminate the area. Within minutes, I'm not even exaggerating, there were over 20 to 30 white, large wingspan moths flying around us. Me, being the absolute weirdo that I am, put both my arms out while sitting with my legs crossed on the ground. Almost every white moth landed on my arms, my head, my legs, and just sat there for a good 90 seconds or more. My own belief of this encounter is that someone or something guided us home, and these moths were a sign that we were now back in safety and away from danger. When I think back to this encounter now, and remember the lost lives of the backpackers that Ivan Millen brutally murdered, I like to think that each and every one of those white large moths were the spirit of each person, ensuring no harm came to another person in that vast forest. I am grateful to these spirits to this day. To the spirits, the lights, and whoever or whatever guided us home that night, I kind of hope we meet again. If I'm in danger, that is. You're listening to Disturbed. Now, back to the horror. Next up, we check in with Reddit user BabyPink93, featuring voice work by Tanya Eby, and we get groomed. My family and I had a caravan in a holiday park in NSW. We would go there every school holiday, and there was many kids I used to run around and play with. I have fond memories of this place, where I learned to ride a bike and had my first kiss but other memories are not as good. And now leave me with that egg flip feeling in my stomach. The people that owned the caravan park had a son. He was roughly 25 years old, and I would have been around five or six. He would drive around the park and collect everyone's rubbish on a tractor and do other odd jobs like this to help out his parents. Every once in a while, he would pull up when I was playing out the front and ask if I wanted a ride on the tractor. I... Being young and naive, of course accepted and jumped on, because what child doesn't want to ride on a tractor? This was back in the days where parents would let their children play in the streets without much supervision, and you just came back home when the streetlights came on. 
One day, when he dropped me back to our van, my dad came storming out, grabbed me by the arm, and yanked me off the tractor. Without saying a word to the man, he took me inside and told me to never, ever hang out with him again. I don't want you hanging around with that man again, he said, without saying why. But he's nice. He gives me lollies, I said. Just don't. I'm telling you, don't talk to him, he replied. I couldn't understand why my dad didn't want me talking to the nice man who only gave me tractor rides, gave me lollies and hugs and sometimes the occasional sandwich. I remember telling the man one day, my dad said I'm not allowed to talk to you anymore, to which he smirked and replied, oh yeah, why is that? Fast forward nearly 13 or 14 years later, my family and I are watching the news when the man's face flashes across the screen attached to a story where he had killed two people and is now serving time in prison. My dad said, look at this, look at this. I knew he was bad news. There was always just something about him. Do you remember when he used to take you around on the tractor? My blood ran cold and my stomach dropped. The most disturbing part? He killed people with pills. He would call his lollies. Please always listen to your parents. My God, I would be dead by now if it wasn't for them. Looking for even more Disturbed? Join us on Patreon for ad-free listening, shout-outs, and Disturbing Calls bonus episodes at patreon.com slash disturbedpodcast. Apple users can subscribe to Disturbed Media Premium directly in the Apple Podcasts app. And finally, we close out the show hearing from Reddit user Caden J. Peters, featuring voice work by John Patnode. And we've never been more creeped out. Locational context. I live on a farm on the side of a mountain in the middle of nowhere in British Columbia's interior. No cell service. Neighbors are beyond shouting distance. A very on-your-own lifestyle out here. My trailer is at the top of this property next to a barn surrounded 360 with forest except for the little road up here. The mountain, Mount Ida, has a long history with the aboriginal people of my area. I've been told stories of the mountain since I was a kid. Basically, the summary of every story is, people are banished from the mountain because the spirits make it too dangerous. All sorts of weird things have been seen and have happened on this mountain. Last night, Around 10.45 p.m., I heard three sets of sirens rush by the road. Out here, you never hear sirens. In my accumulative 15 years here, I've heard one siren, and it was earlier this week. Basically, it just intrigued me at that point. Wasn't until about half an hour later or so, and my power cuts out. I'm already in bed at this point. Lights were out. Only way I actually noticed was because I had no Wi-Fi. Now that's always a heart stopper, because out here, no Wi-Fi means I'm entirely on my own. This makes me anxious for sure, but I'm more worried that I won't be able to call the fire department if something catches on fire than anything. Then, out of nowhere, I hear this super sharp and loud cry. Like a kid who just crashed on a bike. Hysterical crying from what sounds to be a young child. My dogs are going absolutely nuts at the door. Now... If you're familiar with cougars or mountain lions, you should know that they can often mimic a child crying, and scary accurately too. So, laying there as the tension builds, I'm just telling myself it's a cougar, that's all it is. Just a cougar. For me, that's the best case scenario right now, that it's just a cougar. Dogs have finally calmed down, and I'm still just trying to get some shut-eye when I hear the second sound. This was an un godly sound that I've never heard in my life. This one sounded like a mix of every horror movie monster all in one. I can't even describe it. It was about five seconds of pure screeching, like a demonic banshee with the vocal cords of a T-Rex. The bass to it shook my bed. It was as if there was a concert-sized sound system hiding in the forest blasting zombie vomit. I could taste my heartbeat at this point. My dogs are acting like rabies-ridden pit bulls towards the door, 
snarling and growling like whatever just screamed was on the other side of the door. I didn't know what to do at that point. Couldn't call or get in contact with anyone. Lights are all off. I'm just laying there in the dark, utterly and completely scared. I was not about to get up and go investigate. It's the middle of winter, of course, too. I just laid there, checking my phone every 30 seconds, seeing if the Wi-Fi came back. Nothing else came after, though. I just ended up falling asleep at some point. As of this morning, everything is back to normal. Nothing creepy going on. Power's back on. Made a post in the local Facebook group. Nobody else in the area heard anything, and only a few lost power as well as me. So... Take it as you will. Cougar in heat? Bigfoot coming out of hibernation? Thousand-year-old native ghost trying to tell me to get off his land? I'm not a very paranormal guy, and I've no idea what it could have been at this point. Would love to hear your thoughts, ideas, or questions. Update. Time to update and answer a few questions and ideas from everyone. So, to start, it's been confirmed the sirens and the power was lost due to a motor vehicle incident into a power pole a kilometer or so down the road. Strangely enough, I've also found out that the other siren a week or so ago was also responding to an MVI, but in almost the exact same spot. So take that as you will. I also decided to open Reddit for the first time to see all the comments at about 1 in the morning. Terrible idea. You guys have all scared the crap out of me even more, but thank you as well. General update. Yes, to everyone mentioning it, I do have a generator. Problem is, it's up in the barn along with the Wi-Fi router. Definitely was not going to even open my bedroom door, let alone go outside after hearing that and go into the dark and creepy barn to screw around with the Jenny. I've also checked around the walkable vicinity. No tracks or anything of interest that I found. Although I didn't want to go searching through the forest for tracks, to be completely honest. As for gun protection, I would absolutely love to have a gun for this exact reason, but it's a hassle in Canada, and even if I did decide tomorrow was the day, it's a long process and I probably wouldn't have a gun till next winter, so that won't help me now. Cougar? As I said, the first one was definitely a cougar in my opinion. I've heard many cougars throughout my life, and they've made a lot of weird noises, but that second one, I just have a tough time accepting that noise as a cougar. In the defense of it being a cougar in heat, though, the weather has been absurdly strange and very warm. Usually it's about negative 15 this time of year, but it's sitting at around zero these past few weeks. This could cause some animals, including cougars, thinking it's spring, concluding to some weird behavior government lab? I have to unfortunately say this is most likely not the case. I've explored a lot of the mountain as trails in my back 40 go into crown land and up to the rest of the mountain. It's just lodging and trails up there. My area is very boring and you would notice any type of suspicious vehicles coming in and around here. Unless they're sneakily driving around mid-2000s rusted out F-150s because that's about three quarters of the vehicles out here, myself included. I would really like to believe that it was some crazy one-off wild animal sound that was just freakishly close to my trailer. But a lot of these Bigfoot theories are very similar to what I experienced. I don't even want to think of the skinwalker some of you are mentioning. Last night was okay. There was no noises, and dogs stayed calm all night. Let me tell you though, I fell asleep with a podcast playing just to distract myself from the quiet. I'll keep everyone updated if I have another experience or encounter out here. Follow our social channels on Facebook and Instagram at Disturbed Podcast and on Twitter at Disturbed underscore pod. Don't forget you can send in your own true terrifying tale at disturbedpodcast.com slash submit. If you'd like to support the show and gain access to bonus episodes, ad-free content, and early releases, visit patreon.com slash disturbedpodcast. And a big thanks to our newest supporters, and we got a lot of new ones from our recent Disturbing Calls episode. Jasmine Kearns, Ashley Harris, Charissa Dion, Gustavo Romero, Emily Farr Rayner, Kelsey S., Joseph Kennedy, Wes Parker, Rebecca Roskelly, Sophia Uloa, 
Great Plains Traditional Bow, Tori Adams, Thomas Collins IV, Sarah Murphy, Chantelle Moat, Madeline, Saudi Booth, Black Lotus, and plenty more that we're going to shout out next week. Thanks to all of you for supporting the show. Music by Carl Casey at White Bat Audio and Co.ag. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next Thursday with a brand new episode. And don't forget to stay safe out there, y'all.